Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Lucy Crichton, and I'm the Curator of Archaeology at the Yorkshire Museum, which is part of York Museum's Trust. Um, I'm going to be talking about a specific collection entitled Old Collections, New Questions, and this was a project that focused specifically on our collections of Roman archaeology and numismatics. And it aimed, it aimed, at its heart, it aimed to connect those historic questions, which are mostly antiquarian in origin, to the newest forms of research and engagement. Um, it was a DDF-funded project, so it ran from um, 2017 to the end of this financial year, and I need to make an admission right at the beginning. I was only involved in the very last stages of this project. Um, so that means that I didn't get involved with a lot of the detail of the project. However, I was able to observe it from a kind of external, critical perspective, and that sounds more positive than it is. So I've been involved in the evaluation of the project. Um, so what I'm going to aim to do in this talk is to talk about, um, give you an introduction to our collections first, talk about the project and what it aimed to do, look at how we went about um, fulfilling those aims, look at a few case studies of projects that were produced during the duration of this project, and then critically look at what worked and what didn't. So a little bit like Anna's previous, um, previous work. Um, just to give you an overview of our collections, um, the Yorkshire Museum opened in 1830 and it housed the geology and the archaeology collections that were collected by the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. So we are at heart an antiquarian museum. Um, you can see on the top right the beautiful Yorkshire Museum nestled within the ruins of St Mary's Abbey. And then at the bottom you can see another building, the Hospitium which is where the Roman collections of archaeology and numismatics were stored and displayed until the mid-20th century. <coughs> um, this fella on the left is our fantastic head of Constantine. It's one of the star objects in our collection, and it's also the first object to be accessioned into it. Um, the story of Constantine and the, um, the information that we have about him is synonymous for the wider collection as well. So he was discovered before 1823, and he was discovered in Stonegate in York. That's about as much information as we have. Um, this is mirrored across the whole of the collection. So even jumping forward 100 years, this is another one of our key pieces. This is the tombstone of Julia Belva, and we have this fantastic um, image of her being discovered during the building of a road. Um, we have fantastic antiquarian collections, mostly collected during the 18th, 19th and early 20th century. So they have all of that wonderful complexity and lack of information that we're so familiar with, with our collections. Um, they're designated, so this, as I mentioned, was a DDF project. They're of international importance, but... Before this project, our knowledge of them meant what we could do with them was somewhat limited. Um, so our ACE DDF projects, oh, if this slide's messed up, it means they'll all be messed up, forgive me. Um, the aims of it can be split into two general themes. So the improvement of knowledge of the collection. So bringing in new knowledge, increasing in-house knowledge, um, trying to get new research, into the collection and fundamentally and a lot of this links quite nicely with Anna's previous um, previously discussed research framework project is create a long-term research plan so that we as curators can be proactive in the research that we try and do. We also try to increase access to this collection in various ways so developing partnerships across the city um, creating opportunities for new interpretation and specifically opportunities for digital access and interpretation, which is an area of interpretation that we at York Museums Trust aim to lead on. So, oh dear me. Um, here's a summary of the project. So it's a GDF funded project. It, we asked for just over 71,000 pounds. So it's a, a fairly large project, but you can see that the three major pots of money went on three things, project staff, um, we needed to get in a project assistant to make this um, project possible. 
capacity in-house wasn't, um, we had too many other projects ongoing basically to allow us to do it in-house. Um, a digital upgrade, which I will come back to later um, and is still pending. And then the cost of freelancers, which were brought in for specific projects and specific roles that I'll again come back to later. Um, and there's an overview of our internal project team. So although we brought um, people in through networks and freelancers, it involved our curator of archaeology, our curator of numismatics and our digital manager. So to sum up why we're doing this, we have these fantastic internationally important, very large designated collections of Roman archaeology. I mean, look at this stuff, it's fantastic. Um, but the way that we interpret them um, was a little bit traditional. So we've recently, not proactively, but in a reactive way, through researchers approaching us, have taken part in projects that have demonstrated what these collections can unlock and the stories that they can tell. So for instance, um, research by the University of Reading, as part of their diaspora project in the last decade, carried out isotopic analysis of some of our human remains, which demonstrated that they came, um, particular, particular individuals came from as far as Africa. So being able to tell new stories about our collections means that we can interpret them as suitable for a 21st century audience. So we've looked at the old collections how did we go about trying to make sense of them and unpick them so that they could be suitable for new research? I'm going to go through the process that this project took. Um, first of all, looking at the, the top two um, um, products here, a research agenda and a collections audit. Um, so one of the first documents that we produced was a research agenda. And this really put down on paper our current summary of knowledge of our collection. So it summarised the collections, it collated the existing knowledge and recent research that had been undertaken on them, and it outlined the existing partnerships that we had in the city and beyond. Um, to produce this, it was authored by our um, project post, our project assistant, but we also involved two key groups, which you can see at the bottom. So it was a, a cyclical process and we tried to involve as many people as possible in this. We had a steering group of key local partners and academics. So people such as the city archeologist, people from the most prevalent units that carry out work in our region and subject specialists in Roman archeology. span And it was their um, <coughs> role throughout the project to inform, advise and review key milestones. Um, the steering group for this project wasn't as successful as we think it could be, and I'll unpick that a little bit later. Um, we also wanted to share our ideas with the wider community. Um, and if anyone works uh, in a historic city, you'll know that for every road, river, park, green space, there will be a local community group that has interest. So the way that we tried to broaden this out was by hosting study days one at the outset of the project and one closer to the end where we could share our ideas and findings beyond academia and encourage people to contribute to that discussion. And what we ended up with was a very broad list of themes. So we were kind of asking, looking at modern Roman studies, what kind of topics do we want to look at? What kind of questions do we want to ask of our collections? Pretty much covers everything there, doesn't it? It's very, it's very broad, it's very general, but what it does is it gives us a starting point to be able to start commissioning further work and to start unpicking some of these themes. Mm. I do apologise about these slides. So concurrently to the production of the research agenda and its sharing and constant updating, we carried out a collections audit. We realised that for this project to be successful, we needed a thorough understanding of what was in our collections. And before this project, we didn't know that. Um, so from scratch, um, our wonderful project assistant, Emily, with the help of many volunteers, including Joan and Sean here, um, audited everything that we have. So that's 15,000 Roman coins, 1,000 Roman small finds, and 3,000 boxes of bulk archeology. span um, 
So now we're at a position of knowing more what's in our collection than ever before. So this was able to quantify our collections for the first time ever, which in itself is fantastic. It also showed potential areas of, um, of significance, so perhaps large assemblages that hadn't been looked at in detail before. And crucially, it also told us where everything was, which would allow the access that was so crucial to future um, stages of the project. Throughout the collections audit, we also got a better idea of the conservation state of our collection. Um, so we were able to in-house deal with smaller conservation issues like um, repacking of boxes and rationalisation of archives in terms of rationalising space. Um, but it also highlighted larger conservation issues, which we were able to bundle up into this project, such as the repointing of our Roman mosaic. That's probably not the conservation term. Um, so, so we took these two new pieces of information, our broad research agenda and our detailed collections audit, and we commissioned two external freelancers to develop project plans. <laughs> um, we, um, we commissioned two because we got one, um, Vincent Drost on the left to look at our Roman numismatics collections and then Patrick Ottaway on the right to look at our archaeology. Um, these two collections have historically been managed in two quite different ways and up until very recently we've had both a curator of archaeology and a curator of numismatics in post which is quite rare for a, a museum of our size. Um, so both of these um, fellas are experts in their particular area. We've worked with them before. And the useful thing about bringing in external um, freelancers is that they were able to look at our collections from, a, obviously, an external perspective and benchmark them against other national collections, showing their relative importance. And they were also able to highlight objects and assemblages of key importance. So they both produced a research plan for their specific aspect of the collection. And this is the, um, the covers of those two. I've brought a copy of all the documents that were compiled and created as part of this project. So I can share that with you afterwards if anyone's interested. Um, and these two research strategies, again, summarise the collection, but with a level of more critical detail. So highlighting the potential, the areas of real key strength. Crucially then, the specialists also delineated a number of research topics. So we basically have research frameworks here that allow us to go off and be proactive with our research. There were certain limitations to this, which I will come back to at the end. Um, so did we get new answers as part of this? So as well as the one strand of the project that was authoring the research framework, and getting all of those resources in place for us to be proactive about research in the future, we also were able to carry out some um, smaller, more discrete projects during the lifetime of, um, of our DDF project. These can be grouped into several categories. Some of them were commissioned with project money, and some of them just happened a little bit. I mean, some of you were talking about this today. When you get the word out about your collection, it seems like people just come forward. Similarly, and including these two examples, just having the increased knowledge of the collections from the audit gave us new opportunities for interpretation. I've got a few micro examples of this. One is the rediscovery of a hoard that we'd had since 1840. So this was a hoard that was found in the centre of York. Um, a Roman, it was a silver denarius hoard, and it had been collected, catalogued, in a lovely way here, and then all split up and amalgamated into the core collection, which is all well and good for information, but in terms of engagement and display, it makes it rather difficult. Um, so through the help of a volunteer and some very meticulous unpicking of the catalogue and comparison with our collections management system, we were able to reconstruct the hoard. So we kind of have a new acquisition from that. Another example is through the discovery of objects that we didn't know we had. So through the audit, one of, um, one of our volunteers opened a box that contained this object. Um, none of our collection staff had seen it before. We didn't know what it was. Um, we found a brief reference to it in one of our historic handbooks. Um, but apart from that, it could, have been, it could have been anything. It looked vaguely Roman, we thought. 
Um, by sharing this new discovery with the wider specialist world, so specifically putting a note in Lucerne of the Roman Finds Group journal, um, we were able to get an identification for this object. So this is actually a gold funerary plaque that would be placed over the mouth. Really quite interesting. Um, it gets even more interesting in that this is the only one known from the UK, and there's only 23 known from the rest of the Roman Empire. So that's a pretty significant find. Um, through the collections audit work and the, the definition, well, the discovery of this very brief um, description, we were also able to find other material that was found with this plaque. So we've actually got the skull of the woman it was buried with and the coin that was found in her mouth, possibly the coin that was used, um, that the plaque was used to contain. So we've gone from an object that we don't know what it was, an unidentified shiny object, to a really interesting story um, that we could use for any engagement project. We could use it as a future for research. We'd quite like to get um, the stable isotopes done on Our Lady to find out where, whereabouts from the empire she came from. This seems to be an Eastern um, Empire phenomenon, these are the mouth plaques. So we're just starting to tear at the surface of this project. We also utilised new scientific techniques on our historic collections. Um, this project was initiated by an external researcher, Dr Louisa Campbell from the University of Glasgow, and she's got a mouthful of a project, Paints and Pigments in the Past. So her project focuses on the Antonine Wall distance stones, but she's looking for a comparative data set. So she came to look at several of our inscribed stone objects and statuary, and um, including our wonderful statue of Mars. So by carrying out PXRF and micro Raman spectroscopy, I think, um, she was able to identify that Mars actually had a layer of gesso on him. So although the trace elements that would allow us to reconstruct the, his colour scheme no longer survive, and this is an art historical mock-up of him, um, we can now say with certainty that he would be painted, and the results for other aspects of our collections are much more, um, much more illuminating. We were also able to carry out some XRF of several of our Roman coin hoards. Um, again, just a very small sample, a snippet, not enough data to really show specific trends, but enough to create new stories for the collection. So, for instance, the silver composition that was um, from several of our um, silica hoards shows that it's likely that contemporary copies were being made from clippings of the official coins within the hoard. Conversely, um, coins from our recent acquisition, the Walt Newton hoard, which are copper alloy nummy, um, the composition of the official copies, sorry, the official coins and the contemporary copies are very different. So we can start to explore issues and topics of forgery in Roman Yorkshire. We were also able to carry out some geophysical survey in our museum gardens. Um, this was a strategic priority for us in that the museum, Yorkshire Museum sits right within the heart of Roman York. It's just outside the walls of the fortress. And we know that there was Roman activity going on in this space. There's a probable Roman road leading through the gardens. There were limited excavations carried out in the 1950s but the archives from those haven't been studied or, or, or properly looked at. So we were hoping through this to be able to add several new layers of interpretation to our garden, um, to our garden interpretation, basically. Unfortunately, it seems like the Roman archaeology is too deep, but we found out about some new medieval features, so we'll skip over that. <laughs> um, I mentioned at the beginning that um, one of the main um, strands of this project was to increase opportunities for digital engagement. And there was a big pot of money set aside for this. Um, most of that was set aside for a project that would transform our collections online. Um, by purchasing a piece of middleware software, you'll have seen that I've just handily copied and pasted the definition from the website. Um, so basically, we have purchased a piece of middleware software, which is called the SIM, and what that will do is transform the way that we can display our online collections. Our collections online portal at the moment, it's pretty expansive, there's lots of our objects on there, 
but it's directly linked to AdLib, which is our collections management system. And anybody who's worked with AdLib will know that it's just awful. Um, it's very <laughs> difficult to navigate and it has very limited searchability. Um, so the, the way that members of the public can use that data and access it is, is rather limited. What the SIM does, it puts a piece of middleware in between your public facing um, collections online and your database, which allows you to do lots of fun things. It allows you to update your database very quickly so you can put new documentation, new digital outputs, new information on there really quickly. It also allows you to link to lots of other key pieces of information online. Um, it has unlimited or not very limited searchability. So it's not just confined to those specific object terms. There's the potential for people to be able to search for whatever they want and they will collect data. It also allows a two-way interaction. So the public are going to be able to interact with these records. They're going to be able to comment on them. They're going to be able to group them. We'll still have curatorial control over what that means and where that information is used. Um, but it's given us a, a, big, um, a big new opportunity to transform our collections online. With that in mind, we embarked on several research projects, volunteer projects, to start diversifying the types of information that could be added to that system, um, including volunteers who added historic environment record information, linking up the fantastic online portal that York's HDR already has, um, adding things like research articles, so Roman inscriptions of Britain, you'll be able to link through to that, and also things like press. So you're also, you're kind of amalgamating the whole history of research, public interest in a particular object. And for a collection like ours, that's really impactful because we have quite a few celebrity objects where there's a lot of information out there. We also undertook photogrammetry. So we did this in-house by um, taking lots of photographs. Part of the project was to train up our staff so we were able to produce these going forward. And so we created some 3D models which are available on Sketchfab. And again, when our new collections management system is in operation, these will link through to the object records. So it's just increasing the ways that we present information about our objects. And we also played around some augmented reality. Again, this was an external approach from the BBC Civilizations Festival programme, whatever we're calling it. They were particularly interested in using Mars as part of their app. So they 3D scanned him and you can now look at the real thing and the fake thing next to each other. Um, again, just as trying to diversify our digital outputs, several students created a Google Arts and Culture virtual exhibition looking at childhood and we maintained a strong online presence throughout the project. We've heard about the importance of social media um, for raising awareness but we had a particularly uh, popular project Twitter and I probably don't have time to talk about volunteers in much detail but none of this work would have been possible without them. So what were the successes of the project? We have a better knowledge of our Roman collections than ever before including crucially where it all is we have better levels of documentation and collections care, and we were able to commission several creative projects that have already added to the interpretive possibilities of our collections. Perhaps most importantly, and this was the key aim of the project, we have clear resources, a research framework for our numismatics and archaeology collections that allow us to be proactive with future researchers, so we can take the direction of collections research in whichever way we like, we have the tools to be able to easily do that now. Um, when it works, the SIM will have laid the groundwork for transforming our online collections. We've built a network of partners for future collaboration. And interestingly, although this was not a direct aim of the project, we have been able to produce a template for which we can use as a basis to explore other parts of our collection. So our Curator of Natural Sciences is taking both the structure of this project and the learning from it to produce a framework for assessing the biology collections, which is a part of our collections that we don't know very much about. 
Um, we also hope that we might be able to repurpose this as a bit of a resource for other museums with similar collections to use. So what could we have done better? There's been a lot of evaluation above and beyond the normal evaluation that was necessary for ACE reporting and I identified several ways that we feel that we could have improved the project. Um, the project was developed in quite a quick time scale. So the bid was put in at rather short notice, as is often the case with these things. We would have benefited from more clearly defined aims in that process. What we had is quite broad, overarching ambitions. So it was all about ambition. So increasing knowledge, increasing access. Um, which is fantastic, but what I think that meant is that we've tried to do a little bit too much, spread ourselves a little bit too thinly. Um, what we also didn't have when putting this bid together was a nice example to use as a basis. This was very experimental for us, um, which meant that we were kind of writing in the dark. We, again, going back to those brand ambitious plans, we could have done with having some more measurable objectives. Um, what we didn't put were really timely milestones in the project that allowed us to see when things were perhaps going off course slightly. Um, one of these um, things that did go slightly off course was the digital side of our project. Um, there was a slight miscommunication between the people commissioning the software and us as curatorial people who had limited technical understanding of what that means and that ultimately meant that the, that aspect of the project was delayed. Again, going back to a sharper focus, so perhaps we try to do a little bit too much with our 18 months and limited resources. We had a small project team, many of whom were involved in other major projects during the duration of the project. So there were three temporary exhibitions that happened during the same financial year. By building in additional capacity in terms of staff from the beginning, that could have helped with that process and meant that our project assistant didn't have to do so much. Also, we should have utilised our in-house expertise perhaps a little bit more. We have a Roman archaeologist on staff. He's doing a PhD in Roman small finds, yet his um, involvement in this project was quite limited. So I think there's always the feeling the need to get external project staff in where perhaps that resource could have been better used to backfill an internal member of staff. And again, specifics to do with the, um, how the project was run, more clearly defined purposes and scope for each section could have made those um, parts of the project more efficient. So clearer briefs for the freelancers would have meant that they'd have been able to produce what we wanted quicker there would have been less to and fro between the project staff and themselves. One example of this um, was that there wasn't a clear definition about what our internal project team was able to provide them. So it meant that we were doing perhaps a little bit more of the research than, than we should have. One of the key things for me is that I think we might have missed a trick on building in opportunities for community engagement. We have a fantastic um, set of resources that will allow us to be proactive with future research, but because the freelancers that we commissioned to draw up those lists came from an academic background, it means that we have a very academic focus to those research topics. Perhaps building in more community stakeholders, including them as part of that key stakeholder panel, that project board, so including, I mean, partners that we have in the city like the CBA, perhaps other local societies might have got around that problem. And of course, there's always the issues of we could have managed the project better in some ways. There were three project managers. It would have been better if there was only one. Um, and because there were three project managers, it meant that not all of them could go to every single project meeting, which meant that things were a little bit difficult to sign and so we've seen, we've tried to be quite reflexive and critical in the process, but ultimately we have a fantastic, um, a fantastic resource that will aid us with our future research and aiming to be proactive with our Roman collections. And really, where next, we just need to keep the momentum going and start working through this research framework. That was a very whistle-stop tour through a very 
complicated multi-layered process. Thank you very much.